Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us today if you care to. We're going to pick it up today in this fantastic book of Judges, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. And in our last lecture, we had our Judge Jephthah, and he kind of made a vow to the Lord that he probably shouldn't have made. And it's always a good idea, you know, if you go making a vow to God, no, number one, if you break it, it's serious trouble. But Jephthah told the Lord in his vow that if you will deliver the Ammonites and give me the victory over them, uh, then I will offer up and sacrifice the first thing that comes through the front door of my home uh, when I come back in peace. And lo and behold, it was his only child, his daughter, who came through the front door after God delivered the Ammonites into uh, Jephthah and the other men of Gilead's hands. But uh, we spent some time with that yesterday. Uh, I don't believe that uh, he actually offered his daughter as a burnt sacrifice. Number one, at this particular point in time, uh, that was Israel did not uh, have human sacrifice. There's no way. And what he did was he dedicated his daughter to the service of the Lord at the tabernacle. So having said that, we're going to finish up uh, our Judge Jephthah. In fact, is we'll cover three more judges of Israel very rapidly, and then we'll come to the last judge whose history is recorded in the book of Judges, and that, of course, is Samson. So uh, with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to Open eyes, open ears this day, Judges chapter 12, verse 1, and it reads, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward. This word northward, check it out, is Saphon, and it's actually a town uh, that was allocated to the tribe of Gad in Joshua chapter 13, verse 27. And said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passedst thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. Wow! I mean, here, and you remember, this is not the first time if Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, has pulled this stunt. You remember back in earlier chapter when Gideon uh, delivered Israel from the hand of the Midianites? Gideon and his 300 took on 135,000. Of course, God was on their side. But you remember then, the Ephraimites said, why didn't you call us to help you fight against the Midianites? And remember, Gideon he really used good psychology. He said, what? He said, we didn't do anything compared to what you guys did. We just put them on the run. You guys uh, killed their princes or uh, Orb and Zeb, uh, we didn't do anything compared to what you guys did. I wonder if Jephthah is going to have the same uh, success in using psychology on the Ephraim. But Ephraim later became the largest tribe of Israel. And there was always a power struggle, uh, especially between Ephraim uh, representing the ten tribes of Israel to the north after the nation split, and Judah over who was the best, who was the most powerful, who was the leader, uh, should be the leader. So once again, Ephraim got their nose out of joint uh, because of, of not being called. But what's really funny is we're going to find out that Jephthah and the people of Gilead did call. They didn't respond. Verse 2, And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife. We were oppressed uh, by the people of Ammon uh, for that period of 18 years with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. We called, but you didn't come. And now you're coming here to, to burn my house down upon me? What's wrong with you guys? Verse 3. And when I saw that you delivered me not, you didn't come when we called, 
I put my life in my hands. I jeoparded my life uh, because that you didn't come to help. And passed over, and this means passed over Jordan uh, to the east, against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day? To fight against me? Question mark. We called you to come and help fight against the enemy, what should have been a common enemy, the Ammonites, and you didn't come. Now you've come across the Jordan. Did you come across to fight against me, your brother of the same, of the same nation of Israel? Verse 4. Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. God doesn't like uh, civil war. He doesn't like brother fighting against brother. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And this really loses it in the translation. It's really hard to follow what's being said here. Gilead, I'll remind you once more, was the tribes of uh, Gad and Reuben and half Manasseh that took their allotment of the promised land on the east side of Jordan. They're the ones who fought with Jephthah against the Ammonites. Now, what the people of Ephraim are saying, check out this word fugitives, what they're calling them here are strays. In other words, you people uh, of Gilead, the tribes on the east side of, Germ uh, of the Jordan, are no names. And you have no right, if you will, to claim any part of such a noble people as the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's a pretty low blow. And, you know, God doesn't like civil war, but... Uh, Je Jephthah was right in what he did uh, in going and fighting against them. He tried to reason with them. He tried to get them to come to their senses. You know, wh what's wrong with you? We called you to come and help fight. You didn't come. Now you come, and what are you going to do? Are you going to fight against us, your own people? Or are you going to burn my house down upon my own head? Verse 5. And the Gileadites took the passages. These are the, the fords, which were places that you could cross the Jordan. So the Gileadites got to the fords of Jordan before the Ephraimites. Now you see Ephraim is on the west side of the Jordan. So they had crossed the Jordan to the east side to give Jephthah and the Gileadites uh, trouble and now they're trying to get it back across the Jordan to their own homeland where they would be safe because they're getting a thumping is what's going on. And it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, escaped from the battle, in other words, who survived, said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, now what they're doing, you see, they got to the crossing points, and here come these men. It'd be pretty obvious who had just come from battle uh, because they would have their weapons with them, number one. Uh, but they would ask them, are you of Ephraim? And if they said no, and there's going to be a little test here, verse 6, then said they unto him, say now Shibolo, Shiboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. Now you have, if you have a companion Bible note, uh, Bullinger makes a note, and I agree with him, it would be not possible that they killed forty-two thousand of them what this is, is 2,040. And uh, in Numbers chapter 26, verse 37, which would have been oh, 300 years, give or take a year or two, from the last time that Ephraim was numbered. But there, their number was only 32,000 
500, so uh, 42,000 uh, 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 way too many. That's just not possible. Now, what was going on here, uh, by the way, Shibbo left with the, the, the Ephraimites could not pronounce the S-H sound. And so they had made them say the word Shiboleth, which in Hebrew means stream or flood, but the Ephraimites couldn't frame their mouth to say it, and they would say Siboleth rather than Shiboleth. And they immediately knew that they were Ephraimites. And, and that might sound odd to you, but if you've studied uh, foreign languages, you know that there are certain sounds that you just don't have in your native language. Um, some languages have a guttural sound, which is very difficult for someone to master who is not used to making those guttural sounds. And in, in, even if somebody speaks the same language, if you take someone uh, from New York, for example, and you put them with someone from Tennessee or Kentucky, and they're going to have trouble understanding each other, even though they speak the same language, because of the accents, and it, it causes problems in understanding. So uh, they, they knew immediately when the Ephraimites were not able to form their mouth to say the S-H sound. Verse 7, And Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died. Jephthah the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. I have no doubt he was buried in Mizpeh, uh, which is uh, his, was his home. And uh, it's quite common for uh, people of Israel to their body, no matter where they were slain, they would take the body home uh, to bury it. And Jephthah, in my opinion, and I'll remind you, the judge of judges means... Uh, to to rule, surely, but the prime of that word, uh, is shofetum in the Hebrew tongue, is shafat, and it means to set things right and rule. And Jephthah is certainly one of the stronger judges. Uh, he didn't put up with anything from the Ephraimites when uh, they tried to come down on him and say, you know, you didn't uh, call us to help. He, he laid it down to him and told him just exactly how it was, and he, he didn't back down. So uh, Jephthah, in my opinion, one of the stronger judges, he certainly was able to put things right and rule. And uh, Paul mentioned this judge Jephthah in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament. Most of you are familiar that Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. So uh, Paul knew the history of Jephthah, or he wouldn't have included him in the list of those who had strong faith. And certainly Jephthah, a strong leader, and one who certainly loved the Lord and had faith in him. Now, the remaining, what, seven chapters in this verse, we're going to cover real quickly three judges. And if you have a reference Bible, you probably have a reference on all three of them that more than likely they were uh, civil judges uh, and in the northeast of Israel only. So we're not going to spend a great deal of time on them, but let's go with that. Verse 8, And after him, in other words, after Jephthah, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. Now this Bethlehem is not uh, Bethlehem Judah. It's Bethlehem and probably of Zebulun listed in Joshua chapter 19, verse 15. Ibzan, if you translate it rather than transliterate, it means illustrious. Uh, if we don't count uh, Abimelech, you remember him back in chapter 9, our, our type for the Antichrist, for Satan himself, uh, he wasn't lifted up or promoted by God. He was promoted by men. So I don't want to count a them like this would be in that, this, that case our ninth judge uh, recorded in the book of Judges. Verse 9, And he had thirty sons and thirty daughters, whom he sent abroad and took in thirty daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged, judged Israel uh, seven years. Now this word abroad 
uh, can mean foreign, and if that were the case, that he took foreign uh, wives for his sons and sent his own daughters uh, to foreigners to be wives, that would be a strict no-no. That's what got our whole trouble started back in chapter 1 of Judges. Uh, God gave Israel the promised land, but he also gave them instruction in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. You wipe them out. You don't allow the Canaanites to remain alive. Because if you do, uh, you'll start giving your daughters to their sons for wife. You'll start taking their daughters to your sons for wife. And before you know it, you'll be worshiping their gods instead of me. It came to pass, verse 10. Over and over and over it came to pass, verse 10. Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem, at Zebulun, Bethlehem, Zebulun, his home, verse 11. And after him, Elon, which would be our tenth judge in the book of Judges, a Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel for ten years, verse 12. And Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Aijalon in the country, of Zebulun. Not much to say about him either. We had a total of three verses for uh, Ibzon, two verses for Elon. We're going to have three verses for Abdon as well. Uh, so again, at least they probably kept the idolatry down uh, among their people, uh, and that's, I think, the reason that we didn't see much. Not The point that there's not much written about a judge doesn't necessarily mean that he was a bad judge. As I've made the statement before in this book, sometimes if a lot is written about you and it's bad uh, concerning your leadership, uh, that's not good. It's better to have just a little bit written about you, but nothing bad in it. Verse 13, And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pyrathonite, judged Israel. Verse 14, And he had forty sons and thirty nephews that rode on three score and ten ass colts. He had seventy colts. This is a, a sign of wealth. And he judged Israel eight years. Now, check out this word nephews. In the Hebrew, it's sons, sons. In other words, his grandsons. There is no word in the Hebrew language for uh, grandson or granddaughter or grandfather or grandmother for that, that matter either. So uh, nephews, the word not really clearly saying what happened. He had 40 sons and 30 uh, grandsons, verse 15. And Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pyrathonite, died and was buried in Pyrathon in the land of Ephraim in the mount of the Amalekites. So uh, here we come to our last judge that's recorded. He's not our last judge, uh, but recorded in the book of Judges. We have Eli and Samuel, uh, whose history we read about in 1 Samuel. Uh, but uh, we come to Samson. Uh, if we counted Abimelech, that type for uh, Antichrist and Satan, Samson would be our 13th judge. Uh, Samson was the twelfth judge raised up by God, and I like to look at it that way rather than counting Abimelech. In biblical numerics, number 12 is governmental perfection, number 13 is disorganization and chaos. So uh, a lot written about Samson, and rightly so. He's probably one of our uh, better-known judges uh, as far as what the things that he did uh, also, he's a very colorful character, uh, was Samson. But we're going to be covering the history of Samson in chapters 13 through 16. Uh, and again, that's four chapters. We had eight verses or seven verses dedicated to three judges, so uh, more written on Samson than all three of those put together by a lot. After we cover Samson, we'll be covering chapters 17 uh, through 21 in the book of Judges, uh, and those cover what was going on in Israel at the time of the Judges. And 
uh, a lot of it wasn't good, as we'll see. So with that, uh, let's pick up the history of Samson, chapter 13, verse 1, and it reads, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. This means they did the evil with the article, uh, meaning commit adult, uh, idolatry. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Now this would be the longest period of oppression listed in the book of Judges. Many times it was eighteen years, uh, back to that rich biblical numerics in this book, eighteen being bondage, forty being probation. And uh, Bullinger puts this uh, period of time at 1120 uh, B.C. to 1080 B.C. So uh, that takes us all the way down uh, to 80 years from when Saul would become the first man-king of Israel, and the judges would be no more, verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, they were of the tribe of of Dan, of Israel, whose name was Manoah. Manoah, if you translate it, means rest. And his wife was barren and bare not. And I couldn't help but think about how many times in God's Word when someone very important was about to be born was the woman barren, not able to have children. It goes back all the way to Abraham and Sarah. Remember, Abraham was 99 years old. Sarah was 89 years old when they learned that they were going to have a child and his name would be Isaac, uh, in whose name the entire seed of the nation of Israel uh, would be called. Uh, then you have, after that, uh, Jacob and Rachel. Rachel is written of that she was barren at one point in time. Had she remained barren, uh, we would have been without the tribe of Joseph, which is Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, or the, the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, all the way to the New Testament, you can take this. Uh, you remember in Luke chapter 1, the fact that Zechariah uh, was a priest. Uh, he was a descendant of, of Aaron, and he was serving the course of Abiah, in Jerusalem, and his wife Elizabeth, also of the daughters of Aaron, was barren. And the angel appeared to them and informed them that she would be, they were about to be parents, and they would be the parents of John the Baptist. So over and over you see uh, that God, uh, a miraculous uh, divine intervention, uh, sometimes at a point where the people, Abraham and Sarah, certainly considered themselves well past uh, childbearing years. But with God, all things are possible. Verse 3, And the angel of the Lord, now this is God himself manifesting himself to where men can see him, or women can see him and recognize him. You see, he's in a different dimension than we're in. And unless he wants us to see him, he could be right there in the room with you and you wouldn't be able to see him. But he wants uh, uh, the, the, the Manoah's wife to see him. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. He's going to touch uh, this woman, verse 4. Now therefore beware, or be careful to follow my instructions. I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, no alcohol, and eat not any unclean thing. I want you to, to follow the health laws uh, and eat only those things which God said are clean for people to eat. Be healthy, is what he's saying. Verse 5, For lo, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, 
and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samson would only begin to deliver Israel from the, the oppression of the Philistines. That uh, work would be completed by Samuel uh, after uh, Samson dies. A couple of things about this verse. The vow of a Nazarite oftentimes, and by the way, the instructions for those who wish to take the vow of a Nazarite are listed in Numbers uh, chapter 6. Uh, most people, it was normal that they would take this vow of a Nazarite for a certain period of time. And, and the vow, while they were under the vow, they weren't to cut their hair. Uh, no razor was to come to their head. They weren't to eat anything of the vine. No, no alcoholic beverages or even eating grapes was prohibited if you were under the vow of a Nazarite. But let's say someone took the vow for 10 years. He wouldn't cut his hair or she, you know, women could take the vow of a Nazarite. But at the end of 10 years, the hair was cut off and then offered on the altar of burnt offering to the Lord. And it was a symbol that they had worn uh, the hair in strength and in honor of the Lord and vitality, if you will. Um, the, and the, the, the vow of a Nazarite was very strict, as you can see. And I think what the message is going to be to Israel, uh, the fact that Samson is going to be a Nazarite for life. And you note, he didn't have any choice in this. He's not even thought of yet, or he's thought of at this point, but he hasn't even been conceived at this point. And he's already under the vow of a Nazarite. But I think the message to Israel is that deliverance from the oppression of the Philistines depends on you straightening up your act and doing things God's way, a complete surrender uh, to Yahweh, if you will, rather than running around worshiping the gods of all the other heathen nations. Verse 6, Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God, you see, she doesn't even know or realize it was the Lord. She thinks that it, uh, her perception is that it was probably a prophet, a man of God, came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. And this is a terrible translation. This is, should have been translated uh, beautiful or awe-inspiring. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. I, I didn't think to ask him where he was from. And you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't even catch his name. But he, this is the angel of the Lord, said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor drink strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death, committed to that vow uh, for life. Verse 8. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst sin come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Didn't Notice he didn't question the conception. And that shows, uh, in, in, to me, it shows faith that Manoah didn't doubt God that this was possible. He, he took it that this is fact. Uh, I believe that this is going to happen. Verse 9. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And his wife will make certain that Manoah uh, sees the, the man of God as she perceives it. This time, they're both going to know it's not a prophet of God after this encounter is over. They're going to know that this is God. Verse 10. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, 
Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. He's back. You ask God to send him back to us. He's back. Come quickly. Come with me. Verse 11. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. I am. Does that, I know you who have studied God's Word very much recognize that uh, in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. You remember when God was speaking with Moses, and he said, Moses, I want you to do this, 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 and this. Now you go down and you tell the people of Israel, this is the game plan. This is the plan of the day. And Moses said to him, you remember what he said? He said, who am I supposed to tell them sent me? You want me to go down and tell all these people that? They're going to think I'm crazy. And the Lord said, you tell them that I am that I am sent you. So, Ia, Asha, Ia, in, in the Hebrew language, it means I am what I will be. I will become what I wish to be. Verse 12. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? How, how shall we train the child to where this obviously is very important to you. And how is it that we're to train the child? We don't want to let you down. We, we want to make sure that we follow your instructions and do this right. Verse 13, And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. The instructions uh, partake of no uh, wine or strong drink, no alcohol, uh, to not even eat anything of the vine. That would be grapes, raisins. Uh, raisin cake was a delicacy at this time. So she was, uh, the, 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 was to give up everything basically that one might think of as worldly pleasurable is what this is all about. And of course then too that a razor was not to come upon his head. So uh, how will all this turn out and how is the Lord going to make it known that he is the Lord and not a prophet? Well, don't miss our next lecture. we got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please?